you keep swinging the axe and keep chopping wood, if you will, and eventually the tree will fall and you'll be back, you know, day after day after day and stick to the process and keep practicing and keep grinding. And eventually, you know, if you keep swinging the axe, you know, the tree's going to fall. Okay, we are back. This is Stephen Holder here with Zach Kiefer, and it's the next edition of Chopping Wood. We know you couldn't wait, as usual, so we're back to do our do what we do here. And this time it's for real, right? No more preseason, Zach. We're, uh, we're on to the regular season. We're on to Los Angeles. And uh, how are you feeling about your Indianapolis Colts here? Most anticipated season opener in NFL history. <laughs> <laughs> you go back. You go back a couple years ago. We went to Denver and we had Peyton Manning versus Andrew Luck. And this year, we do one better. We have Jared Goff versus Scott Tolzien. I mean, if that ain't must see TV, I don't know what is. Well, are we going to get ten points combined on Sunday? Mm. Are you asking me to wager money on this because I'm not confident? <laughs> so it depends. If you're asking me to put my money where my mouth is, I'm not entertaining this. It's just hard for me to see either offense doing a whole lot. <laughs> so, anyhow, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, we we were just talking among ourselves about old Charles Pagano, as some may call him in town. No names, but uh, yeah, Chuck Pagano. He's he's in a mood, but but a good mood. He's he's loose. So we'll get into that a little bit. And uh, they've also made a few changes to their offensive line. What else is new? It's um, it's Wednesday, so the offensive line must be changing, right? And, right. And tomorrow's Thursday, so who knows what could happen. And uh, we've also got to get into a little bit of Andrew Luck, as usual, a recurring theme on this podcast now for the last eight years, it feels like, in terms of his shoulder injury. Uh, we'll talk about the Rams a little bit, and then uh, old Mr. Scott Tolzien, who is replacing Andrew Luck. So uh, your starting quarterback. So anyhow, let's dive right into this. So Chuck Pagano. <laughs> he, uh, he, I've never seen this, by the way. This is a little bit of color for you guys. So practice just got underway, and they let us see like you know ten minutes. It's really like twenty, but feels like thirty seconds. But anyhow, they're out there doing their thing, getting ready, warming up, and here comes Chuck. I'm thinking he's going to the bathroom or something, and he stops and he <laughs> he sort of takes Zach under his arm, and he has a little word with him, like everything okay over there, Zach? He's in a good mood. He, uh, he was sort of joking with me about one of the questions I asked during today's press conference, which was just about them starting 0-2 the last couple of years. That'd be three years in a row for the record. Wait, have, have they been 0-2 for three yeah, years in a row? Not, Is that right? It's not a good way to start oh, the season. Um, they recovered in 2014, as you remember, and made the AFC title game. Not so much the last two years. But he almost you know, made light of it and said, why you got to ask that? Why do you got to get this in these guys' heads? And, uh, he, he seemed to me like the last couple of weeks like, he understands the situation he's in, and by that I mean it's not a great situation to be. You're playing for a general manager who did not hire you, and for an owner that has basically been abrupt about saying, we'll evaluate things next year. We'll see it where we are after this 16-game season. Chuck Pagano is the coach for 2017, period. End of statement by Jim Mercer. Yeah, he's got two years on that contract, <laughs> but I don't know how much that means right now. So anyway, I think Chuck Pagano is under the impression that the odds are against me, and we don't have a very good roster, and I'm going to try and make the best of it. And I'm going to have fun along the way because what's the worst they can do? So They can't eat you, but they can fire you. <laughs> it's been well documented. Trademark, Chuck Pagano, 2015. <laughs> I tell you, this beat is the, the gift that keeps on giving. But, you know, if this was a less uh, family-oriented podcast, uh, the kids today might say, He's got no more mm, to give, you know, and <laughs> it's kind of like that. I, I really have gotten that sense. But at the same time, I also see a different Chuck to some extent. I've seen that guy as yes, well. Yes, that's a good point. But Right, but I've also seen a guy who is like, you know what? You guys better get it together, not yeah. us because, you know, I like, don't, I don't like, have to listen like to Like the him. receivers, get on the field. Yeah. We saw a guy, I thought, at least in the preseason, a guy who was – Really not taking as much crap from his team this year and holding him more accountable, I thought, which is never a bad thing and, and something that's probably overdue, to be quite honest. And we'll see how that carries over, if at all, in the regular season. But I had have had a couple of players, I've had that conversation with a couple of players, and they agreed that they were seeing some of that as well internally. 
So that's really interesting because I think Chuck has been very much a rah-rah guy, support his players, and he still is, and he always will be. But maybe he's getting in their butts a little more this and, year. And look, this is something that no one's talking about right now, mm-hmm. would probably with good cause. But look, he could come out of this looking really good. And I don't think a lot of people have really considered that. There's a lot of things to make you think this is not going to happen. But if they somehow miraculously win three of their first four, hypothetically, um, if Tolzien plays better than we think he can, if they pull out some close games against, let me remind you, a very bad schedule to start. And I mean mm-hmm. bad as in the bad teams they're playing. Mm-hmm. It's a very weak schedule. Chuck Pagano could look really good. Yep. I don't expect that to happen. I just don't think the team is good enough, especially defensively. Um, but if they win two, maybe three of these first, you know, they have San Francisco in week five for the Peyton Manning statue game. They have Cleveland in there. They have um, the L.A. to start without Air Donald. Chuck Pagano could make himself look pretty dang good uh, in terms of the coaching job he's doing early on if they can scrape together some wins. You remember what he did with Matt Hasselbeck mm-hmm. back in 2015? Yeah, and look, I've always felt like this this first quarter of the season was always kind of like one of the key, well, maybe the first five games was kind of the key to the season. And, I again, I've said this before on, on previous podcasts. I, I don't believe in easy schedule, hard schedule. Like, there's no such thing, right? I mean, right. You know the the winning percentages between the team with the the toughest schedule and the weakest schedule is always like, you know, right. very low. And it right? changes so much as the season yeah. progresses. And but that being said, I think we can say with some certainty, the L.A. Rams got a lot of challenges, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can say the San Francisco 49ers, they're probably not winning the Super Bowl this year. The Cleveland Browns, they got a lot of work to do, and yeah. so that's your. Those are three of your first five games. Especially San Francisco and Cleveland at yeah. home. Yeah. I don't care who your quarterback is. Win the game. Yeah. So, look, I'm not here to to prognosticate or any of that because we know we suck at that. I mean, right? I mean, that's that's why that's why I, I'm here to second-guess them when they make <laughs> mistakes, right? Because right. it's far be it from me to actually have to be accountable. But, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I also think that, you're not crazy to have a little bit of optimism. I'm not saying expectations. There's it's, a difference. It's like winning with money you've already won. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 yeah. You if know. you're up two hundred dollars right. in the casino, right, right, yeah, I'll put a fifty dollar bet down. I right. won't, but right, because you're already you're already expecting, <laughs> if not the worst. It's, you're expecting some pretty rough times. You don't have to go home and tell your wife, "Hey, uh, 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 I lost the, the the light bill money." Right. You know, like you don't have to do that because yeah. you're up, right? Yeah. So. Maybe that's Chuck right now, and that's why he's over there, you know, giving you the business and <laughs> messing around with you, you know, because he figures what's the worst that could happen. Right. Well, the worst that could happen is they fire him, but but he's he's yeah. already stared down the barrel of that gun, right? So, Twice. Right. <laughs> it's it's re- it's a remarkable thing to have done to start zero two the last two years and have this. Black Monday of mm-hmm. waiting, and he survived it twice. I mean, they like, can't eat you. you. Cannot kill this man they to his credit. They can't eat you. So, anyhow. Speaking of Chuck and that press conference that you just talked about, one of the things or the theme that dominated it today was, I, I think, us talking to him and asking him about this offensive line. So they put out a depth chart, as they always do every week. And it's always weird in the preseason, right, because I don't even think the coaches put out the depth chart. I think no. I think the PR staff, like, watches practice and they're like, all right, just, you know, pencil that guy in. Right? And because nobody cares. And so that's why the preseason depth chart is like a joke, and we all know that. So when the regular season depth chart came out on Tuesday, I was very interested to, to look at it. And, and then I saw it, and I was like, this isn't right. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my thought. Right. They like, switched the guard and the tackles. Right. I'm like, this isn't right. <laughs> Joe Higgs on the bench, and Denzel Goods at right tackle, and Jeremy Vuznovich is the left guard, the left the starting left guard. I'm like, this ain't right. So I just kind of discounted it. And – as it turns out, I was wrong. <laughs> so this is a we, bold move. It is, right? It is. I mean, so they, let, let's tell people what they're doing. Right. So, so a couple things are happening here. Um, Denzel Good is going to be the right tackle. Now, this is as of today. Okay, this is Wednesday. Who the hell knows what they're going to do tomorrow? Right. But for now, it looks like the plan is Denzel Good at right tackle. Uh, the right guard is Jack Mehort. That hasn't changed since preseason. Jeremy Vujinovic is your left guard. Yeah, and then Deshaun Bond at center You know, for Ryan Kelly. And, and Joe Haig on the bench, which is probably the biggest stunner yeah. of all. So I think Joe Haig is a little gimpy right now. That's a factor here. I, I, know, I know he is. It has right? to be. Yes. He's one of their best linemen. Yeah. 
Joe Haig's a little gimpy, and I think that's why that's why he's the odd man out here. So whatever, take that for what's worth. But it's pretty bold. I thought going with Joe Haig over there. I'm sorry, Denzel Good. I should say at right right tackle, and they're going to give him a shot, like maybe to win this job. He thinks he. He thinks he can get in there and like make a statement. We'll this is, see. This is their third right tackle since training camp started, yes. right? I mean, it was Raven Clark's job to lose. He lost it. Then it was Jeremy Vujinovic, who you, you know, who you can depend on to a degree in that spot. And now Denzel Good, who really hasn't played the tackle position in a while. Mm-hmm. We're gonna find out. But like you said, this is this is Wednesday, and, and Sunday's you know four days away. And who doesn't say they'd come out there on Sunday during warmups and totally change it up? But. Mm-hmm. Kind of like you mentioned earlier, this is four or five years of this, of the same exact thing where they're just <laughs> moving guys around constantly and consistently and trying to find the right five, and they haven't done it. And that's why they've had the same problem over and over again. It's exhausting <laughs> for yeah, me at least. Right. It's exhausting for me because, I mean, I don't want to write about and talk about the offensive line like this much, right? Uh, it's not interesting necessarily. But, you know, we've had to do it because this has been a – consistent theme now i'll say this for the colts and i think this is the case here injuries have played a part in all of these moves right they've not just like gone in there and it's like they can't make up their mind that's not necessarily what's happening yeah but there has to be some frustration because there some of it has been underperformance too in some cases right yep. you know like the raven clark, clark he's not hurt the raven clark was supposed to be the right tackle right why why, why are they starting now they're it looks like their third different right tackle since the preseason started. And, and right? the tackle they drafted in the fourth round didn't even make the 53-man roster. So that adds mm. to the concerns. So, <clears throat> as it turns out, maybe Chris Ballard is not a is not an offensive line savant either. <laughs> yeah, clearly that's, that's I think been determined should, after one draft. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why he's still here. <laughs> I can't believe he still has it's a job. It's been interesting to see the responses from people. They they will turn <laughs> against people fast. Yeah, so, you know, look, it, it's interesting. But I would also say this is not unprecedented. I mean, these things do happen in the NFL. You've got 53 guys. And you've got to make it work. So, look, you're going to have these things happen on the offensive line. For the Colts, I think the question, as much as the starting five, as much as they want to have that solid starting five, the question for me is also depth. Because yeah. guys are going to get hurt and guys are going to miss time and practice and what have you. The key is depth. And that's the big thing in the NFL because guys are going to miss time. What are you going to do when you're missing your right guard? And – it's Thursday, and now this guy goes and tweaks an ankle in practice, and he's out, right? right. So you got to figure it out. Or during the second quarter of a game, which we've seen happen over and over and over again. Yep. So so one thing they that they have going for them here is that these guys are, are battle-tested at different positions. I mean, Jeremy Vujinovic, for example, he, he's been a guy who – He's been around this program now for over a year or so, you know, on and off the practice squad, what have you. And um, he's been the guy who – <laughs> Will they call up when everybody's hurt, right? Yeah. And like, he's hey, the, uh, you. Yeah, he's the new Joe Wright. Yeah, and so I asked him, I said, how much has that helped you? And he says, man, you know what? I'm ready for anything because he has had to be ready for anything. So, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but Chris Ballard said, Vuznovic, he said this week, he was like, that was a surprise. Yeah. Like, that guy came out of nowhere. And, he, you, and you talk to the players on the offensive line, and they rave about this guy because he is so dang consistent, right? That's the that's the goal with that position, right? Just bring mm-hmm. it every day. And he's a guy who's he's very quiet, and you don't really talk about Jeremy Vuznovic a lot, but the quiet consistency is something that has caught more than one set of eyes. Yeah. I mean, well, let's – full disclosure, I just met the guy today. Okay. Right. So <laughs> that's where we're at. Uh, one other tidbit on the offensive line. Um, I had a quick word with, with Al Woods, who – He's like 30 years old. This guy's been around the league. I think he's been like five teams. He's seen it all. And he saw me over there talking to uh, Deshaun Bond, and and he's a nose tackle, Al Woods, so he would be very familiar with Deshaun Bond, you know, going head to head. And he's and I said, uh, what do you think of this kid? He's like, man, you know what? He brings it. And he said that kid plays hard, and he makes plays. He's strong as an ox. So Deshaun Bond has believers in that locker room. That's one like we said. We, we heard from Chris Ballard on Monday. That's one of the reasons they did not keep Ryan Schwinke. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Ryan Kelly's your center of the future and the present whenever he gets back from that right. foot injury. Um, but Deshaun Bond 
to his credit, was a guy that was thrust into this surprise opportunity midway through camp. He didn't even know Ryan Kelly was hurt that day until we told him. <laughs> and he has done everything to, to make them feel good about that position or as good as they could feel. Yeah. So, you know, look, take it for what it's worth. He hasn't gone up against Michael Brockers and Robert Quinn yet. but He's not seeing Aaron Donald, though, and that's – but I mean, yeah. That's a reason to celebrate this weekend. So that's a huge break for the Colts, but uh, the Rams are getting a big break here too, right? So Andrew Luck's not playing. As you know, no more mystery there. So let's talk about going forward. I want to bring up something that I think we underplayed this week. I don't know if you saw my tweet the other day. Uh, on Monday, Chris Ballard talked to us, and he talked at length, I think, about Chris. Excuse me, about Andrew Luck. And I think we, we have pretty much – a majority of the information right now. Um, well, let's put it this way. We have more information than we had, right? And I thought I thought he gave us as much clarity as we're going to get for the time being, right? Let's put it that way. I'm not going to say we know everything because we don't know what we don't know. But the one thing that stuck with me out of that was this. It is very clear to me they want Andrew Luck to practice for a considerable length of time before he plays. Now, he is not practicing today. He ain't practicing this week as far as I'm concerned. So the question here is not when is Andrew Luck going to play. The question is when is Andrew Luck going to practice. That's what we should be asking, and that's the most important question. And I will tell you this. I heard from somebody inside the building kind of clarified this for me. My question was, okay, Chris Ballard said Andrew Luck's in the training phase, and I never – I should have at that moment followed up and said, "Um, what the hell does that mean? And what, as it's been explained to me, here's what that means. He's strengthening the shoulder. So if he still needs to strengthen the shoulder, that's not something that's going to happen <coughs> in a matter of days. I think this is a situation where he's a week, two weeks out, maybe, yeah. you know, potentially yeah. from practicing. Practicing, okay? And then they wanted to practice a couple weeks. So, right. so. What are your thoughts? I mean, did you read it that way? Do you do you think now that we should be thinking, you know, weeks, not days? And, and what is your yeah, sense of it? Absolutely. That's a good point you make. Boy, we've come a long way from a week ago <laughs> when Jim Mercy said, boy, I hope he's out there for the Rams game. Well, he did hope. <laughs> he just knew it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> this is something that I've talked to shoulder specialists about, which I think is very relevant here. No, they did not treat Andrew Luck specifically, but they have made this a point. It's about the practice, and not to quote Allen Iverson here, but look, he needs to come back and be able to practice for two weeks, and it's not just the first practice. He's going to look great or whatever. He's throwing the ball again, right? It's how his arm feels the next day and mm-hmm. the next day and three and four or five days consecutively. That's when they know they can throw him out there in a game situation. Such a good point. And I, it's going to be two weeks I mean, of practice whenever he gets back at the very minimum. So all this talk, can he get ready in a week? Can he, you know – um, crunch that practice time, that preseason down to four days or, or two weeks. No, it, it, that was all fool's gold. Um, he's going to have to practice for a good amount of time for them to feel good about throwing him out there. I don't think we see him until, and I'm just guessing because nobody knows the answer, including the Colts right now, uh, week four at the earliest. That's Seattle. That's Seattle, yeah. I think that's that's still on the table, I would say, just based on what we know. Like if, if everything, we're, if our reading of the situation is accurate, I would say that's – a possibility, right? Right. But, but again, um, <laughs> they they have to get him to a point where they're comfortable with his ability right. to do what you just said, which is practice every day. And Chris Ballard said that specifically. Right. He says, I wanted to be able to practice and practice every day. They're not playing in the AFC Championship game in three days, and they're just going right. to you know, have him go through a walkthrough and, and just wing it. Right. No, it's not going to happen, and, and they're going to they're going to substantially take a look at his his work load ability mm-hmm. for a long period of time, and it's just there's no way there's no other way that they're going to do it. Because remember that was a key last year, and I think I thought yeah, about and this. He brought that up. That was a really good point. Yeah. I thought about this. You remember we went to Anderson last year for training camp, and Andrew Luck. I don't think he missed any time. No. I, I'm pretty sure he did miss any days, right? In Ryan Grigson's words, he threw a million balls. Okay. And he did. I mean, he missed right. he missed zero practices. And then what happened when we got back here for week one of the, the regular season? Limited. We got out here for Thursday practice, and they're like, yeah, Andrew's going to miss a little time today. And we're like, what the hell? And that's when we had to go back to Ryan Grigson and say, hey, man, what the hell's going on? And and that, that was a whole mystery. Remember that whole, that whole thing? And that's where – the genesis of all of this mistrust with the injury 
kind of came from, I think, which is you said he was fine, and then now he can't practice. What? The, which is it? So right. I think that's that's where people that's where people's sort of misunderstanding began. I think with this whole injury, and I think but, you know yeah. you go back to last preseason, and they they chose not to have surgery last off season, mm-hmm. hoping mm-hmm. that the shoulder would fully heal on its own. And I think after that, 2015, after going into 16, there, right, there was the, the shoulder injury was there on top of the ribs, but he. Mm-hmm. You know, went through training camp and the shoulder wasn't feeling 100%. And they decided we're going to rest you every Thursday this whole season or at least mm-hmm. one day a week. He spent a lot of time in the training room and that's what set him back. He still had a great season to his credit, um, but that's what they're trying to avoid this time around. Yeah. So I think we just might as well just, you know, kind of talk about this in very realistic terms. So, you know, don't don't expect if if we get back from L.A., on Monday, and Andrew Luck trots out there next Wednesday for the right. first day of practice. Right. Don't think that means all right. Here we go. Yeah, he's under don't, center on don't Sunday. Th- don't think it's like six days away. Yeah, I, I don't believe that. I could be wrong, but that's not the vibe I'm getting. Yeah, I think you're right about that. So, so I would say the fact that they have been so conservative to this point, and Chris Ballard used the word conservative. He did. He did. That is not going to change once he gets back into practice. That's going to continue. That conservative approach is going to continue because, hey. The truth of the matter is, we talked about you know Chuck Pagano <laughs> right. being under pressure and and knowing what he's up against. Well, Chris Ballard, that ain't his problem. Nope. <laughs> okay, so Chris Ballard is is a factor here. I think Chris Ballard is is pulling the reins back a little bit and saying, "All right, hey, let, let's let's take this slow." Yeah. And I get it. Yeah, I get it. And I mean, the only guy that's at, at at a loss here is 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 Chuck Pagano, mm-hmm. who needs to win this year and needs to show improvement. And he's getting handed a team that's not ready to do that. So, yep. So somebody's got to play quarterback this weekend, and it's uh, it's Scott Tolzien. So Jacoby Brissett's here. You know about the Philip Dorsett trade, and we should probably hit on that here in a second, just to tie up a, a bow on that. But uh, as it relates to Scott Tolzien, I I actually. I tell you what, I watched that Pittsburgh game, and I mean, look, I, he didn't knock my socks off or anything, but but they were functional. Yeah, and I think a lot of this is going to fall on Chud, Rob Chazinski. Can Rob Chazinski sort of, you know, draw up a game plan that gets Scott Tolzien in position to make some plays and make something happen? Right. Um, that <clears throat> Pittsburgh Steelers game last season, the regular season game that Scott Tolzien started. That's a different animal, all right? Different different opponent than he's going to face this week. Now, this is a good defense, too, but that's an explosive offense that we're facing that day. Right. You know, they put up, to what, 27 points, I thought, in that game? 28, and you had to yeah. keep going with that. You had yeah. to try and keep pace. Right. And that's a lot of pressure on your offense. So – so you you're gonna approach that game plan differently if you're Rob Chazinski. If you're going up against Hell, 15, Ben and and fifteen points might win in on that Sunday. offense. Ten points might win. So I think they can get creative here, and I think they can really play to his strengths, which unfortunately is not throwing the ball down the field. Okay, but they can play to his strengths. They have they have running backs coming out the yin yang. Okay, right, right with Matt Jones here now. And I talked to Robert Turbin today, mm-hmm. and I asked him about that very specific thing. Like, you guys are gonna have to carry the load a little bit. And he said, "We're ready." And you know, you hear that a lot in this yeah. league, right? But he he looked ready. They have four running backs right now. Yep. Uh, and they all do different things. So that's sort of an underscored you know storyline right now is maybe the Colts running backs in the running game can carry this offense to a degree. That's good enough to scrape out a win on Sunday. I like these running backs, probably this running, this backfield. I should say. I like this backfield probably more than than I even realized. I mean, I I, I like it. It's, it's got to be their best backfield since we've been covering the team. Yeah, I've, the more I've thought about it, the better I feel about it. I mean, Frank Gore, by the way, I don't think Frank Gore is is the answer. Certainly, I mean, he's thirty four years old. I mean, it is what it is. He's like a he's he's. He's like a you know a pink elephant, right? I mean, at 34, playing that position, but he looked great in the preseason. I mean, like great. He looked yeah. like he actually gained a step instead of lost one. Yeah. So take that for what it is. But he looked great. Robert Turbin is is the is the most predictable guy on this roster, and that's a good thing. Yeah. You know what he's going to give Third you. Third and one. Yes. Colts have struggled with that for years. He'll get you in he, the red zone. He'll get you the touchdown. He falls forward. And then the lightning bolt that is Marlon Mack. Uh, he flashed in the preseason. That's what you want to see. Mm-hmm. Um, if he can turn a big play on Sunday, that will go a long way in helping this offense. Just one big play will help this offense, I'm telling you. Sure. 
And it takes so much heat off the quarterback when you can get an explosive play exactly. out of your backfield because now exactly. he doesn't have that pressure on him. So I I think this is going to play a big role in it. Rob Chazinski is going to play a huge role. And obviously the ball's in Scott Tolzien's hands. But I, I think it's about everybody else as well. And he didn't get any help in that Pittsburgh game last season on Thanksgiving. Correct. And you saw the outcome. Philip Dorsett, by the way, who, you know, speaking of the devil, Hughes dropping that game. I think did he drop a touchdown if I'm not mistaken? It was a fourth and goal. A fourth touchdown. and goal. Yeah. And, and and tell me if you agree with this, but this is what somebody told me about Philip Dorsett after the move was made. Mm-hmm. The day he was drafted to the day he was traded, nothing, nothing changed. He didn't mm. look any different. He didn't. It didn't seem like anything changed. That's an indictment. Yeah, and and maybe that's on the coaches. And and I personally liked Philip. He was a good kid. Mm-hmm. He was accountable. He was thrust in a tough situation. He handled it well, mm-hmm. but the production was not there, and it's f- for all to see. Um, and, and I mean, think about this just uh, in terms of black and white. The Colts traded their first round pick from two years ago for a third string quarterback. That's <laughs> true. I mean, when you put it that way, that is a huge indictment of, yeah. of where this team sits right now because the Jacoby Brissett move is, you know, he's your backup quarterback for the next couple years. Right. So in a perfect world, he doesn't play. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, and that you hit it on the head there. Why did they trade Philip Dorsett? Well, so I was told over the weekend. Um, in fact, the Colts told Philip Dorsett's agent this very this exact version that they had been getting calls about Philip for several weeks now, and that rings true because we heard this rumor that he was on the block, and they probably made it clear. And that's why they were getting those calls. Now I don't know what they were offered. I, I'm sure they weren't offered, you know, any first round picks, right? <laughs> but, but for whatever reason, whatever they were offered for Philip Dorsett, they decided that wasn't a price they were willing to accept. So they declined all those moves, all those offers. And best I can tell, they were willing to sort of, uh, you know, keep him because they were down to the final day. Right. And if this Brissett trade doesn't come along then they're keeping Philip Dorsett on their final roster. I don't think they were going to just cut him, right? So, Because they saw him as a commodity. So so you don't cut that guy. And you know what? And that trade just piqued their interest, and so they decided to pull the trigger. Why? Because you know their scouting staff always monitors guys, and they look at quarterbacks, they look at running backs, they look at all positions, and one of the quarterbacks they liked was Jacoby Brissett. And, and there was a chance he was going to come available because the Patriots had three quarterbacks. So... It kind of fell into place, but um, but I was on on Dorset. I I kind of wanted to see one more year. I wanted. To, I was curious. I, I wanted like to see he what he could do. Another year. Yeah. And uh, another year of comfort in the offense. And uh, he had a nice game against the Pittsburgh Steelers in that third preseason game, for mm-hmm. whatever that's worth. Right. Um, I mean, his first year was sort of robbed of him. He was injured at most of it last year. Uh, he didn't produce the way he should. I think another year would have, you know, would would have done him good here, but. We'll see what Bill Belichick does with him because if he if he becomes a star in New England, <laughs> that's an indictment on the Colts coaching staff. It is. It, it would not be a good look for the Colts offensive staff. And you know, the other thing on Philip, I, I will say, while I did want to see another year, and I was just, I think out of curiosity. I mean, look, I don't have to. I'm not the general manager. It's not my tail on the line. So yeah, you know, whatever. I'm not the one having to make the right decisions and make hard decisions. But um, one thing I'd say that. That I think to Chris Ballard's credit, if you want, is last year Philip Dorsett had every opportunity. Yep. When Dante Moncrief was in and out all year, and even when he did play, Dante didn't do very much. So <laughs> he had that opportunity to be the the number two guy, and he just couldn't step up. Didn't happen. I mean, by the end of the season, Chester Rogers was the more complete, productive receiver. Yeah, and the, Chester he, from Grambling. Excuse me. <laughs> as as Andrew Luck. <laughs> first introduced him to us did you know who he was talking about back when he said chester from grambling no i didn't know he was talking about i i, mean, I, I think i it took me a I second said, i was like oh why, number three yeah why yeah, do you yeah talk about practice squad guys all the time that was my response <laughs> he and knew, here we are he knew something you didn't know imagine that andrew luck knows a little more about football than you um so anyhow it'll be interesting to see i'm, I'm definitely curious to see how philip does this year in new england and uh, you know Brissett, as i said if this Andrew Luck thing lingers, it remains to be seen whether he can become a factor in this quarterback conversation. Like if Scott right. Tolzien doesn't I, doesn't I f- step up, I fully you know? expect him to. 
and you know, it wouldn't be the Colts, right, if we weren't talking about quarterbacks, right? So. Right, and, and Chuck Pagano <laughs> said that on Monday. Look, he he came here to compete for a spot. I don't yeah. know what spot that is. You know, long term, <laughs> that's the number two spot, but um, but somebody's got to play quarterback, so we'll see. As the world turns on West Fifty Sixth <laughs> Street, the Colts turn. So uh, let's wind this down with uh, looking toward the opponent this week. Um, look, I'm not an expert on the L.A. Rams. Okay. Um, figure that i've but, typed st louis rams like four times this week and it's I've gonna had to, happen I have had to backspace it's gonna happen it's gonna get in the newspaper at some point so look they don't they don't have aaron donald he's holding out because he's worth a billion dollars and he knows it and that is a huge hit that's a huge huge hit but 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 do you think let's put it this way um when you look at the la rams and, and you look at this matchup what do you think the Colts struggle with most in this game? I mean, the easy answer is moving the ball down the field. I, mm-hmm. the first downs, I mean, just basic elementary <laughs> offensive football. <laughs> you just didn't see it in the preseason. And, yeah. and guys like T.Y. Hilton disappear. Mm-hmm. And that's not a good thing. I mean, he, he, without Andrew Luck on the field, and we've talked about this on previous podcasts, T.Y. Hilton is not himself. So that makes you worry. You know, they're going to see a lot of Jack Doyle over the middle, I expect, on Sunday because that's an easy pass. That's a, that's a Scott Tolzien-type pass right there. Uh, I'm really anxious to see what the defense looks like because I'm you yeah. just got to be worried about the back end and we talked to Malik Hooker and Quincy Wilson today and Nate Harrison's going to be in there as well. There's just some young guys and it's not like they were out there every day during the preseason either. Uh, so that makes you wonder. We're going to see what these guys are made of because they're going to get thrown in the fire right away. But the good thing is they're not going against Tom Brady or Drew Brees in week one. They're going against Jared Goff who has struggled mightily since being taken first overall last year. Yeah. I, I think the defense, it, it's a huge point for me because I feel like I don't know anything about this defense. Nine new starters. Mm-hmm. I did the math today, and that's, you know, you can make a debate on was Darius Butler a starter last year? Yes, but not in that position. Mm-hmm. Henry Anderson did not start a game last year. Nine new starters. It's crazy. Now, what I would say is, you know, that's the fact that we don't know anything about this defense. Look, that's certainly not comforting. But at the same time, last year's defense was abysmal. So these guys have a chance to be difference makers, not in the not in the form of like the 85 Bears, but like they have a chance to they have a chance to like, you know, be a, a factor for this team and, and help bridge that gap to Andrew Luck, you know, whenever he comes back. Right. And do you – let me ask you this. Do you mm-hmm. – are you buying the take the, the takeaways? Uh, there were seven in the yeah, preseason, seven yeah. in four games. And like we've, you know, we've written and we've talked about, that is the great equalizer for a bad defense. That's a great point. And, look, I think there is something to be said for – making an effort to take the ball away and they did that because it was a focus of yeah. of this team in the preseason and in the offseason and I mean they made it like a competition they talked about guys. it in April and May mm-hmm. and June and we saw it in, in August so will yeah. we see it in September when it matters yeah and and I will I'll tell you I wrote about this um, a couple weeks ago and one thing I learned was I went back and I looked at their turnover ratio not just their takeaways excuse me not the ratio I looked at the turnovers from recent years by the Colts defense and do you know that in 2013 and 2014 which were really good seasons their turnovers were way up they were pretty high in fact they were very good and then the last couple years you know the numbers were down 2013 Robert Mathis had a career year strip Mm -hmm. sack 2014 Mike Adams had six interceptions led the NFL and that just disappeared the last couple years so that tells you something I mean, those things matter, and they make a big difference, and and it gives your offense a little margin for error. And right. damn, if they don't need that right they now, they need it in the worst way this week. Yeah, and the so, next couple of weeks. So look, you know, hey, if you want something sunny, we end it with something sunny. All right, so there. See, it's not all negative all don't, the time. Yeah, don't Chuck, say we're just Mister Negative over here. Yeah, you know that's why you got a talking to today because you know Chuck says you're you're always negative. But I got well, take the, that, Chuck. I got called into the principal's office. Go chop that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I think uh, we've probably you know sort of run on enough here. Um, Predictions for the game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to do that. That's right. And next week we'll have our first wood wood chopper. <laughs> I think the odds of uh, of it being Jack Doyle are like one to one. <laughs> it, I mean, it is isn't it it's, like it's the Jack Doyle the award? Jack Doyle honorary whichever the week award. He got it like <laughs> seven times last season. I mean, it's named. It's basically named for him. It's he was 
not the namesake, but he was the he was the inspiration. He was the inspiration. Thank you, thank you. I'm not a wordsmith today. Uh, so, all right, I'll just go with the prediction I made in the newspaper. Now, this won't be the case throughout the season because things will change and those predictions will become moot. But, right. but I'll go with what I said. I actually picked the Colts. I put my name on this story actually, <laughs> and I picked the Colts to win 17-16. Not because I'm a homer or anything, just because. I actually think this is going to be that kind of game, and someone has to freaking win. Yeah. So, there. It could come down to one play, and who knows who makes it. Because right. Because these teams are so um, – they're lacking in so many areas, right? I mean, right. the Rams' offense is abysmal. Right. Uh, I picked the Rams to win 15-9. to I just don't see the Colts moving the ball very well. I don't trust the Colts' defense. Mm-hmm. Maybe I will after a couple of weeks. I just don't know what to expect so far. Um, but we'll see on Sunday. It's going to be exciting to see an actual game. You know, so much was limited in the preseason. They didn't, you know, they didn't pile all the stops. Even Chuck said they were very conservative on offense with Scott Tolzien, you know, for that very reason. Um, so maybe he's maybe he's got more in the tank than we thought. Yeah, and I, I think overall, this team right now, they're going to have to get some breaks to win the, to win games. And and I don't mean breaks from the other team, but I mean like th- they can't get in their own way. So the mistakes, no, they can't do it. Right. They can't have that. He talked about that a lot today. Yeah, and I, and I think he's right. I mean, he said it won't be perfect. He said that a hundred times. It won't be perfect. Well, that's the problem. It's not going to be perfect, and you don't have a lot of margin it's, for it's error. It's as simple as they can't have false starts and go and, mm-hmm. and, and go first and 20. They can't overcome first and 20. They're right. not good enough. Right, right. And so you'll be able to tell right away if this team's ready to go and if they can avoid those penalties. Okay, yeah, I think we better stop because we're starting to get negative again. So <laughs> <laughs> It's inevitable. Yeah, it's who we are. It's who we are. Anyway, uh, I'm Stephen Holder here with Zach Kiefer, and this is Chopping Wood. Uh, stay tuned for Sunday. Stay tuned to Indy Star, and uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.